Um, James Smith Cree Nation is, as you saw, 58 kilometers east of Prince Albert. Its territory includes a stretch of the North Saskatchewan River. So on the south side of the river, there's fertile lands for farming, and on the north side is forestry lands for hunting, fishing, trapping, and gathering. Uh, the First Nation received its name from the original Okama, or chief, who signed the treaty um, number six in 1876 at Fort Carlton. Um, we also have Katie Doksawatsky. Um, so Katie is a Master of Journalism student at the University of Regina. Um, she was the field producer for the first segment of the film, which was uh, Team Fire. Uh, she also um, conducted research into legislation and oil spill reporting requirements and coordinated accountability interviews um, with government officials. Um, and we have Emily Eaton, Dr. Emily Eaton as well. Um, and Emily Eaton is Associate Professor of Geography at the University of Regina, specializing in political economy and natural resource economies. Um, she's also author of the book Fault Lines, Life and Landscape on Saskatchewan's Oil, Econ Oil Economy and Growing Resistance, uh, Canadian Farmers and the Politics of GM Wheat. Um, we also have um, Norm Sakuda. Um, Norm is the Director of Communications for the Petroleum Technology Research Centre in Regina. Um, he has a Master's of Fine Arts from UBC and a Master's in English Literature from U of A. He began working with PTRC in 2008. Um, PTRC manages research projects looking into new technologies um, for improving the efficiency and lessening the environmental impact of oil production. It also conducts research into CO2 utilization and storage. So I'll, um, as a moderator, I'll ask a few questions. At the end of that, we'll have time um, for some audience questions as well. So um, I'm going to start with Norm. So why do you feel, as we saw in the, the film, the oil industry is so important to Saskatchewan? Well, I guess to some extent you had some of that in there in terms of the number of jobs that are there. Direct jobs, I think you said around 13,000, something like that. Indirect jobs, according to the Ministry of the Economy, and I had I printed off some stuff, because you know, to some extent, I'm not so sure of the economics of it myself, so I was, I was online being a communications guy. Um, um, about 35,000 jobs in total, so 14,000 direct, about 35,000, so that would include, for example, if we have an open house about a project in Esteban, you know, we have paper, and we have whatever. So those jobs are impacted by you as a normal gas industry person, right? So obviously it's jobs, but you know, there are four main natural resource industries in Saskatchewan. You have farming, which is the biggest, still. Um, you have um, weathering apps, you have um, potash, thank you, and you have um, uh, uranium, right? And I suppose there's some other ones like there's diamonds developing up north, and like that. but those are the four big ones. So um, those four industries um, are crucial for economic return and for spin offs on the economy. So, I mean, I don't know really, you know, those are kind of obvious answers, I guess, but in, in terms of economic impact. Um, but you know, there isn't, as your movie noted, there's only about a royalty from the land that's around 700 million a year. Um, and that's a fairly small percentage of the overall budget of the, of the province. So, um, in terms of royalties, it's lower. In terms of you know things like taxes from salaries paid to people and things like that, it is quite significant. So, it is important for the reasons that have also been stated to those local communities, but also on the broad provincial level. And Emily, I'll pose the same question to you from your work. Why do you find that the oil industry is so important in Saskatchewan? Um, that was one that you didn't alert me to. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, obviously the things that Norm has already outlined. Um, I think that this particular government has really understood itself as um, the champion of oil and gas producing communities and as the now really the only lone voice um, on the national stage um, for, as, as I think they would characterize, defending the industry against um, Eastern politicians who want to impose um, carbon pricing, um, and also against uh, like urban environmentalists who uh, want to bring the, the oil industry down. So I think that this government is, again, that's their, their characterization. Um, I think that this government is particularly 
invested in cultivating that identity, um, their base in terms of um, the people who vote for them is largely rural. You can't win an election in Saskatchewan without also, or with only winning in the urban areas. Um, and so, um, yeah, I think that they've really tried to um, sort of champion those, those issues um, for rural communities and tried to tie rural, the identity of rural communities um, more tightly um, with the oil industry. So in addition to the things that Norma said. And Okuma Burns, so this film was shot in March, so can you tell us a bit about what has happened over the summer at James Smith, at James Smith Creation in regards to the Husky oil spill? Uh, yes, uh, thank you so, so much for being here. Uh, it's a privilege and honor for me as a, as a chief for that in my community. Right now, uh, James and Cree Nation is still going forward on a cleaning up efforts uh, back in our territory. James Smith runs through uh, the North and South Saskatchewan River. Uh, there was, uh, <clears throat> I guess there was uh, some havoc with the province saying that, uh, that they own the river. But through uh, uh, Chiefs way back, back in my, my community, I guess there was a, a injunction with, with the James and Cree Nation and um, a submission on behalf of James and Cree Nation that they do own the river, uh, the riverbed. <clears throat> so the water that goes through James and Cree Nation affects us in a, in a big way uh, through traditional use, uh, hunting, fishing, trapping. And uh, still today we, we own water the river some little bit of signs of uh, uh, life coming back to the river, but not too much. But like just looking at the video kind of upsets me again on the pH levels. You know that's one of the things that uh, has changed the creation. Is you know I'm I'm very keen on what I say and how to say it. I believe in my 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 creator. And he put me here for a purpose, to protect our lands, our people. And I'm making sure that, that our voices are heard, not only in the provincial, but the federal jurisdiction too as well. <coughs> Through economy, industry. You know, I'm not, I'm not opposed to anybody that comes to my, my territory. You know, with readings and also looking at a perspective where, you know, they have to take an account on what, what happened. We calculated six days from the oil spill to Jason territory. Six days. My first official meeting that I had was on the road leaving North Battleford on the tailgate of a truck. And how to go, how to, make sure that our lands are protected. A lot of that uh, information that was shown in the scene uh, is true. You know, it's sad to say and, and hear what, what, what happened to these families that all these gases that are, are coming out of the ground affecting a lot of us in a big way. And I'm glad you mentioned the uh, um, diamonds. That's another powerful hurdle that James Smith Cree Nation seems to believe to have to look at. They say we're 96 kilometers away, we're only 4 kilometers away. So things like that, we, we James Smith Cree Nation, you know, we're trying to be sovereign. Sharing information is crucial. A lot of that information, you know, we just spent another 10 grand to access freedom of information through the courts two days ago 
on this bill. There's two reports that needs to be addressed. So, uh, for me as a chief, it doesn't stop here, it keeps going. And I'm making sure that, that our voices are being, are being heard in a professional manner. You can say a lot of, a lot of negative things on, on the industry, but it's us. We gotta make them accountable for their actions. So with that, thank you. Thank you. And are there other nations along the river that are sharing your concern as well? Yes. Um, matter of fact, that uh, I think we're the only first nation that has our uh, file their suit. And we gave it until January, this coming January. If not, we're going after the province and the federal government. And that was your suit with Husky. <laughs> when was that suit with Husky filed? That was filed a couple months ago. Um, so Katie, as our student investigator on the panel, um, what was the most shocking thing for you that um, came out of this project? Um, I think uh, if I could take away one thing, from all of the research that uh, that we did, was um, just the fact that these incidents that you all learned about, whether oil, uh, salt water contaminant, gas leaks, um, they're just th they're thought of as normal, and um, they the government's approach is that they they happen, and and then as long as the cleanup process is triggered. Um, we're good to go because uh, it's been reported and we're aware of it and the company is presumably uh, doing its job and that um, is just, that's just the attitude that you encounter when you uh, interview government or um, or even, you know, that same kind of attitude. Uh, so I was on the team that went to Esteban and you know it's just, um, it's just part and parcel, it's just part of the course and uh, even you know raising questions of well, why why does it need to be like that is uh, it's really hard for people to kind of step out of that and look look at it objectively. So that was one thing that I could highlight. I think I was, that's what I would say. And Emily, in the film, you say that the relationship between oil and industry and the the oil industry and the Sachs government is is intimate. So why does the oil industry have this close relationship with uh, government in Saskatchewan? Um, well, in uh, an answer to the previous question, I talked specifically about this government, but I'll say that um, I don't want to look partisan because I'm not. <laughs> um, I think that this has been, you know, an ongoing problem in the province um, that dates back to well before this particular Saskatchewan party government. Um, and I characterized it as intimate because that's the way that people characterized it to me when I asked and um, I have done some interviews with regulators. Um, I've also done interviews with um, people who are at various levels inside of companies. Um, and even at the top end of oil company executives of small companies, um, that's the way that they talked about their relationship with um, the regulator. So I think in the film you saw at one point, um, Somebody said something about Brad Wall access his cell phone. Um, and I think, you know, that's really um, indicative, maybe, yeah. So this is the case at all sort of levels, at the, regular, at the, at the regional offices um, where the inspectors are. Um, it's the same thing, that there's this very close, intimate relationship. You can get on the phone and talk to somebody and you can have your issue resolved without, for example, fines and penalties. Um, and one thing that I wanted to highlight um, was an interview I did in the Ministry of Environment. Um, oil and gas infrastructure doesn't, is not normally constituted as a development under the environmental assessment. 
um, app, and somebody in the Ministry of Environment, who I can't name, um, told me that this process began in 1999, mm -hmm. um, and that was when the Ecological Protection spe Specialists decided <coughs> they would actually write letters to companies, to companies um, in order to say that the, the Ministry of Environment's opinion is that oil and gas infrastructure will not constitute a development under the Environmental Assessment Act. What that means is that it's not subject to environmental impact assessment. And so um, when we uh, got data from the Ministry of Environment's Environmental Assessment Branch um, from 1981 to 2010, there were just four environmental impact assessments that were completed for new oil and gas projects. That's a 29 year period for environmental impact assessments. From 2011 to 2015, which was a time of um, really intense development and a, and a big oil boom, um, there were only two oil and gas projects that went under went an environmental impact assessment. So when I say that the, the relationship is intimate, um, these people in the ministry told me that they um, sent those letters to companies at the request of the companies. The companies didn't want their infrastructure to be considered developments under the Act. Um, so that suggests to me that um, the regulators aren't setting the rules under which companies can operate. Companies are requesting of the regulators what the rules are. Um, and where there are rules, some of them are really great. Um, but there's also a lack of um, congruency between the rules and people's um, and the reality of people's actions in the field. Um, the reality of, of companies' actions in the field. And I think this is only made worse by the um, process of regulation by declaration where um, we're trusting companies even more to self-report about what they're doing in the field. perspective in the work you do, why is that um, it important for the oil industry to have this kind of close relationship with the schedule? What I'd say is this, I think when you're creating regulations, whether that's in oil and gas or that's in farming, you obviously want to have the conversations with the people in the industries, the people in the industries who are working in this industry. So when you're setting regulations, you certainly need to consult, right? I'm not of the opinion, on the basis of even this movie and what I've read in a few articles, that the regulator should be the company themselves. I think you have to have a responsible <laughs> regulator who goes out there with the right technology. So speaking of technology, what I will say, and this is, it'll take me a few minutes to explain this about how a company can become involved in the process of determining what kind of monitoring and measurement happens in this place. Because with the Waverman project, I've been with the PTRC now since 2008. The Waverman project started before I started there. And the Waverman project was a CO2 injection project, which is still ongoing at Waver, right? Because the CO2 that's injected in the field causes the oil to expand. They were only getting 30% recovery, which is pretty good for an oil field. But with the CO2, they're expecting to get 50 to 60% recovery. So the International Energy Agency and a whole bunch of companies decided internationally we'd really like to measure and monitor the CO2 in the reservoir to see what it's doing because globally going forward, there are certain industries that have no other option for mitigating their CO2 than injecting it if they can capture it. And by that, I'm not necessarily saying we're not going to comment on Boundary Dam because there's lots of people who would say hydrocarbons being used for CO2 recovery that you have other methods of using CO2 recovery. But for something like, let's say, a steel plant, or for a fertilizer plant, they have no other means of doing anything except energy efficiency to reduce their CO2 emissions. So then we capture them. So we're, the PTRC is a leader in looking at storage, not in capture. Okay, so go back to the Wavelength project. When I was involved with it, it was decided the first year I was there, we need to do a risk assessment. You know, like the injection had been going on for a little while. There was already set suites of measurement and monitoring technologies being used in the field to make sure that the CO2 was staying where it was supposed to stay. But we decided, you know, the PTRC said, we really need to do a risk assessment to see what the local community thinks, to see what regulators think, to see what the industry, in this case, the Novus thinks at the time, I think it was in Canada, where it's pretty, it's changed its name a few times. So 
what we did was we got a group of people together from the community. We surveyed the community randomly. I think we ended up with some of the native community there. I don't remember now, there's about 25 people. There was, the mayor was there, but we also had um, the two individuals who were responsible for like, the patch of native grassland in that area. That's one of the two left in Saskatchewan. So we got them all together for a day and we said, okay, let's do a risk assessment. And the risk assessment is done in two ways. First of all, you identify the severity of an incident, and then you identify the likelihood that it's going to happen. And you talk to the members of the community for a day, and you say, okay, identify for us all of the incidents that you think that could happen that would be the most serious, and then tell us you, how likely you are that you think they'll happen. So for example, you say, okay, we don't want CO2 leaking to a lake. We don't want CO2 to leak from a wellhead. Those are obviously the two highest risks and probably also the highest likely. You get a bit silly in these assessments because you end up with a meteorite impact, somebody said, and it destroys the gas plant. You know, what would that do? Well, that severity is way up there, but the likelihood is way down here. And what you end up with coming out of that is a kind of line where above this line, the risk is unacceptable. You have to provide mitigation technologies to do it. Below the line, you can say, okay, we're not expecting a meteorite impact. We're not going to have a series of measurement and monitoring devices in place to deal with that. And what you ended up with the waiver, and I think that this is interesting for the remainder of the life of the project, is all of the main assets in that community that they were most worried about and, they, and that they considered within the community to be at highest risk, leading to us looking at what measurement and monitoring technologies would be used in those situations to best protect it. So we had soil gas monitoring stations, we had atmospheric monitoring stations, we sampled the wells in the area every six months, you know, the drinking well. There had been baseline taken in those wells, importantly, before CO2 started. And as you may remember, there was an accusation of a leak at Weyburn in 2011, and we were able to, on the basis of the baselines that we did, on the basis of the ongoing monitoring that we've been doing nearby, and by bringing in the British Geological Survey, we were able to determine that it was actually respirated CO2 in the soil caused by, you know, animal, animal matter and things like that, and that it wasn't an unusual reading from CO2 leaking. So, the company was involved in that process. They had to be involved in that process. And I don't know whether you can do that for every project, because that costs a pretty good whack of money. But that set a standard, I think, the risk assessment of waiver, for determining what you need in terms of safe measurement monitoring at a site. Um, and now that the research is done on waiver, um, those technologies, some of them are certainly still being used. One of the other things to do with a project like that is determine what measurement monitoring doesn't work and why a company may not need, need to do it because it doesn't provide any information. So yes, I do think it's important, long way coming back to your question, for industry to be involved in the decisions about regulations. Should it be a regulator? No. <laughs> so in my opinion, and I think that the PTRC, because we are involved in research, that's what we do, we suggested arising from that wider project that you need to have a risk assessment we need to look at this overall. And arising from that, maybe there's some regulations that also, I don't know, um, fed into the provincial government. And certainly we're being asked to do that at some point. We're going to be asked, we'll talk a bit about the new methane regulations because I think we're going to ask about that a bit later in the federal regulations and what PTRC may potentially do in relation to that. But I hope that's an adequate explanation of how I think companies can be directly involved in the creation of this. Just to respond to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in my interview with Doug McKnight, mm -hmm. the assistant deputy minister, I asked him about regulation by declaration. And, yeah. um, and, uh, and he said, yeah, you know, it's industry, or industry, it's, it's norm, it's this audit process, right? Um, reporting and then auditing reports. Um, auditing reports afterwards because the alternative that you're describing this risk assessment process yeah. is not efficient it's not efficient you well, know for the government to invest in it i guess waiver had 40 million dollars in investments in companies all over the world so we have a budget i guess but, but maybe what you're saying is that this is a possibility there is it is a possibility and there are ways i think of streamlining it i mean you obviously can't do it for every well that's being built but if you have a whole field maybe that's about to be developed <clears throat> you know when it's significant and you have several Potential wells are going to be drilled. You could probably meet with the local community. You could ask them what their concerns are. You could ask them how they want it to be monitored. And then you tell them. 
I mean, that's what interaction and cooperation is about. Um, Oklahoma, I'll go back to you. Um, so our film opens with the indigenous voice and their indigenous voices um, throughout. Can you kind of help us understand the, the connection or, or maybe tension between oil industry and indigenous claims to land and treaty rights, maybe in your experience with the uh, Just in regards to that, uh, um, dealing with industry itself in regards to the oil spill, you know, that's, that's a first for us. And, uh, you know, we have a bylaw in our community um, that was <clears throat> submitted in, in Ottawa from uh, looters. And I'm very, very thankful that uh, our chiefs back then had developed this policy or this bylaw. So every day, every day that since we were dealing with this, this uh, thousand dollars a day. But uh, in, in accordance to that, I have achieved and uh, made amendments to that, to that bylaw for federal jurisdiction and, and um, dealing with our membership right now. I'm pretty sure that we can pass legislation. Uh, just last week I passed my, my first legislation uh, with, with my membership uh, with other concerns. And um, <clears throat> things like that uh, on the forefront. Uh, it's so frustrating it seems sometimes mm -hmm. and, and because uh, my elders back at home keep telling me, what are you doing? What are you doing? Well, this is what we're doing. And this is how we're going to do it. You know, they're, they're getting frustrated because they can't have that luxury and their time at the river. You know, there was times before uh, all of our all of our elders gathered at the river, you know, just to fish, crop, pick medicine. A lot of that has diminished, and it really affected our lives um, back in James Smith. And from there, you know, we're still studying. A lot of that has to be um, more regulated in the I did a, I did a, <clears throat> a presentation in, in Manitoba on the same thing with all the Manitoba chiefs uh, in regards to the disaster that's, that are happening to, to Canada. Mm -hmm. You take a look at uh, climate change. The patterns and migrations of the, the caribou, hurricanes, tornadoes, you know, we in Saskatchewan never encountered tornadoes way back. There's always um, <clears throat> our elder that always told us on the prophecy that you know, things are going to be happening. The, the ground moves every single day. And things like that, you know, I take my, my culture and my, my uh, tradition very seriously. Um, Katie, I'll go back to you. You were saying you did an interview with Doug McKnight, so that's the Assistant Deputy Minister of Petroleum Natural Gas Division uh, with the Ministry of Economy. And you were the contact point between our, our project and government. So can you give us a bit more about what that experience is like? Right, so maybe I'll talk a little bit about that strategy uh, first. Um, so there are four teams, obviously, that, that, as you saw, and um, the, we decided that we would have one contact, one contact with the government because to have um, four different teams all needing accountability questions from the government, um, it, well, it would just be a, maybe a logistical, a bit of a logistical nightmare. Um, and it also, uh, to be completely transparent, might scare the government away from wanting to offer comment. Um, so we decided that Team Fire, which is my team, would be responsible for organizing accountability interviews. And, um, and I got the, uh, the job of interviewing uh, the Assistant 